Network, please visit their website, kgraradio.com. You are listening to the Strange Oddities Podcast, which rebroadcast on the KGRA radio at 2 a.m. Eastern Time, 11 p.m. Pacific Time. All right, everybody, welcome to Strange Oddities Podcast. I'm your host, Matthew J. Haas. I'm excited tonight because we, of course, as always, every week we try to have an amazing, exciting guest on our show. We have a really amazing guest to offer our viewers and listeners tonight on the Strange Oddities Podcast. But as always, guys, before we go ahead and introduce our awesome guest, um, let's get this, you know, logistics out of the way, guys. We do have a po- um, we do have a web website. The website is strangeoddiesespodcast.wordpress.com. Real easy. Um, there is a chat room. If you follow us on Facebook or YouTube, comment under the live Facebook feed or comment on our YouTube channel, guys. As always, subscribe to the show if you if you. Can sh- you know, so kindly subscribe. The little bell at the top right of our main YouTube channel, just click that little bell. It'll take you right to the subscriber page. Um, it's pretty simple. So, guys, um, we have a really interesting topic tonight. It's kind of dark um, in a way, uh, but it, in a way, like, it, the topic falls into secret societies or a secret organization because, um, you know, Strange Oddities podcast isn't just about ghosts and supernatural. You know, we cover a pretty broad variety of topics and mysteries and secret societies is one of them. And I thought this would fall in that category. So I'm going to go ahead and introduce our nice guest that, you know, took the time out of her busy um, writing career to be a guest on the Strange Oddities podcast. I'm going to introduce Miss Gabriella Coleman. Gabriella, um, welcome to the show as I get in here. Here we go. All right. Welcome to Strange Oddities podcast. It's uh, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, no problem. Um, for those who don't know Gabriella, I'm going to give them, if you don't mind, Gab, uh, just to give them a little short bio of your background uh, so they can learn a little bit about who you are. Uh, we're going to get you know into your background here a little bit. Uh, you know, it says here that you hold the wolf chair uh, in scientific and tech, uh, technological uh, literacy at McGill University. Uh, you train as an anthropologist, and I believe you're a professor in anthropology. Uh, her scholarship covers uh, the politics, cultures, and ethics of hacking. She is the author of two books on computer hackers and the founder of editor of Hack Curio, a video uh, portal into the cultures of hacking. Uh, you can learn more about the project here on her website, GabrielleColeman.org. All right. Um, and then it also says here she is currently working on a book of essays about hackers and the state and uh, well deliver material from the book uh, for the 2020 year, Henry Morgan Lectures. Her first book, uh, Coding Freedom, the Ethics and Aesthetics of Hacking uh, was published in 2013 uh, with Princeton University Press. Uh, she then published a book, uh, Hacker, Hoaxer, Whistleblower, Spy, uh, The Many Faces of Anonymous uh, in 2014, which was named uh, Kirkus, uh, 
from Kirkus Reviews Best Books of 2014 and awarded the Diana uh, Forsythe uh, Prize by the American Anthropological Association. Wow, congrats to you for that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, so that's a little bit about, um, you know, a really you know, brief background. There's a big long bio on her website. You guys can go check it out. Again, GabrielleColeman.org. Um, Gab, th thanks for doing the Strange Oddities podcast. We have a lot to talk about. We sure do. We sure do. Yeah. Um, how about you g just tell our listeners, uh, the Strange Oddities podcast viewers, a little bit about yourself. How'd you get started into like the hacking writing and, and what, what drew you your interest in it? Sure. So as you noted, I'm an anthropologist and uh, it was quite weird in, in high school. I took an anthropology class and I was like, oh, I want to do this. It was one of the few things where I kind of had uh, a, a sense of clarity about my future. I think many of us are always confused and this is what I wanted to do. And, and in many ways, I worked um, in very traditional topics. Um, I'm from Puerto Rico and I was working in the Caribbean. Uh, on religious healing um, and spiritualism. And I ended up getting quite sick during grad school for a year and I was stuck at home, like many of us are stuck at home right now, <laughs> right? Or yep. at least at home a lot. Yep. And I, I kind of had this little side interest in computer hackers, I'll, I'll explain why in a moment. And I just spent all my time researching them, right? Because I was online. Um, so eventually I just jumped to the hacker world. Uh, but it was, it, was, it was a bit of an accident, right? If I had not gotten sick for that year, you know, I would still probably be working in the Caribbean, which is a great place to work. Sure. Different. <laughs> yeah. Who wouldn't mind working in the Caribbean? <laughs> no, I know, especially now as yeah. winter time is in Canada. Yeah. Um, so, but, but very briefly, I mean, um, hacking encompasses many different types of practices uh, from hacktivists breaking into government servers to tell them to F off yeah. <laughs> to security people who are trying to stop those hackers. Right. Um, and, and my first entryway was into the world of free and open source software. So people who made thing who make things like Firefox or Linux. Right. And I was just, what, what surprised me was that these hackers had reinvented the law. So instead of copyrights and patents, they created their own um, licenses. Mm. And I was like, oh, wow, these technical nerds are also re-engineering the law. Mm. And that's what fascinated me. And, and that's my first way into this world. Uh, right. But obviously, many different aspects of the hacker world sure. um, fascinate me. And I've researched many different aspects as well. Right, right. And of course, one of the biggest hacker organizations that's out there today and very widely recognized across the, the world now uh, as known as Anonymous, which is, you know, kind of, you know, what, you know, you're the leading public speaker of Anonymous that, you know, your book kind of led you to that path now and, you know, your research and your background now. Um, you studied a lot about Anonymous and, you know, I, I like, I think he, like, he's not just like one individual he's like got a bunch of followers that now copy him and you know first, first people thought it was just one guy and then now there's a whole bunch and there's a, like a, there's a lot that goes into it yeah and it's not just he either right right <laughs> but yeah we should we should talk a little bit about what anonymous is i you know a lot of people do know but a lot of people may not even know what anonymous is yeah if if you don't mind sharing what you think anonymous is because I know like some people think what it is, but what your definition versus what others think he is. Cause some people think he's a whist, you know, he could be a whistleblower. He could be a rebel or he could be a foe. He could be somebody who's not good. He could be somebody who is good. There's a lot of different things that he, that he really, you know, gets his hands on as far as information. So right. go ahead, get, get, give our listeners what you think he is. So anonymous is a name uh, that different groups and individuals around the world have taken in order to lay claim to various protests and activist actions. Mm -hmm. uh, it's often identified with the Guy Fox mask. Uh, right. And people probably know who Guy Fox is. 
uh, because Guy Fox has been memorialized in movies like V for Vendetta and the graphic novel by Alan Moore. Um, but what's fascinating about Anonymous um, as a kind of protest collective is that it, it isn't identified with a single individual or gender or race, it's anonymous. Who's anonymous, right? Yeah. And so you're always like, who is anonymous? And and certainly we do know that a lot of people who've been involved in the past uh, were computer hackers because they were hacking corporations and governments, leaking information. Sure, they even hacked the Federal, uh, Federal Reserve. Yeah, um, and many people involved don't do hacking. They just are on Twitter or supporting through making videos. They're very famous for their videos. Right. Um, and what's interesting about them is that they initially came from anonymous image boards, mm -hmm. like 4chan and 8chan. Right. Where you post anonymously. Okay. And everyone posts anonymous, anonymous, and a kind of collective identity grew around the name. Mm -hmm. Um, and people would initially use the name for, com for, for computer trolling and harassment. It wasn't identified with hacktivism or activism right? until about 2008 when they targeted the Church of Scientology, a very right. secretive organization. Yeah, another secret um, organization. Yeah. Yep. And which I, I kind of find funny that a secret organization hacked another secret organization. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, you know, the secrecy of anonymous, I mean, it definitely exists. Um, it works slightly different than the secrecy of Scientology. Sure. Um, but when they targeted the Church of Scientology, which was in 2008, and they targeted them after the Church of Scientology threatened um, journalists with lawsuits because a video of Tom Cruise right. had, had leaked to the internet. Um, it's a very funny video. I recommend that people Google it. <laughs> um, you know, uh, Anonymous decided to troll the Church of Scientology, you know, send them pizzas and do phone pranking, things like that. Right. But through the course of that trolling campaign, people are like, oh, maybe, maybe we could use our, our um, tactics, our trolling tactics for good. Mm hmm. And then that's kind of opened the door for activism right? and hacktivism. And then in 2010, 11, it exploded and, and really converged with things like WikiLeaks. Right, right. And that's when you had like a worldwide protest hacktivist movement known right. as Anonymous. Right. Now, I think a lot of people get confused about Anonymous thinking that like he, all right, he's anonymous who's hacking these big organizations. Um, but the agenda is kind of, I think, interesting because they're really kind of just kind of stealing information per se, rather than holding like a ransom note for money or that's right. Right. They're more like fishing for information to see, all right, what can we use this against this company? Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, there are criminal hackers who, uh, might take over, you know, hack into a hospital mm -hmm. and uh, freeze access, encrypt all the files and say, mm, you know, unless you give us money, we mm -hmm. won't de decrypt these files. Right. right? right. Um, and unless you have backups, you're screwed. Um, yeah. <laughs> an anonymous. And LifeLock won't, won't help you. <laughs> no, exactly. Back things up. You always should have offsite backups. Yeah, security sure. Security advice. Um, <laughs> whereas Anonymous between 2008 uh, forward tended to get involved in political causes mm -hmm. of various sorts and various kinds. And they didn't always hack, but when they did, um, certainly they were hacking either just to protest, like um, maybe they did a website defacement mm -hmm. um, where you enter into a computer and you just uh, change the front facing web page. Right. They did this against PBS and I could talk about why. Um, <laughs> and they put a very funny picture mm -hmm. and so nothing was damaged. They didn't steal anything. Right. And in other cases, they, they would enter into a company's servers, snatch the documents, the emails, 
um, and then post them out online and try right. to kind of expose creepy shenanigans mm-hmm. um, based on the information they found. Sure, sure. My my thing is with them too is um, they um, kind of like uh, where is it going with this? Um, they they use this information as whistleblowing so they're not really into it for the money but what really gets me about anonymous is that how powerful th- this entity or this organization is because of the type of information that they do get so obviously this group is very intelligent very smart they know how to breach systems they know how to get into certain systems um especially like like I said earlier, like they get into the Federal Reserve, that in itself, you know, um, being that that's the Federal Reserve, nobody breaks into the Federal Reserve, you know, without, you know, Homeland Security getting involved. But um, you know what I'm saying? So, like, I, I think he like he or them are very kind of like them, definitely them. <laughs> you're right. Them are very powerful in a way because of what they can get their hands into. Sure. I mean, um... it's scary. It is. It is. Um, there's there's two things worth mentioning. I mean, certainly many of the people involved um, have tech skills. Mm-hmm. Um, they're intelligent. Uh, but it's also the case that a lot of organizations don't have good security either. You know? Right, right. And so you don't have to be like, you know, a mad genius to break into these things. You do definitely have to have resolve and commitment and skills and capacity. And maybe, um, you know, it's super risky as well, right? And and I think like some of them weren't thinking through some of the implications because because many did get caught, many got arrested. I I was just gonna say, there were some that got arrested, they, you know, they weren't that smart because they got themselves arrested. (laughs) Exactly, and many were quite young as well. Like one of the um, uh, really, really generative groups was called lull sec, L-U-L-Z, uh, sec. So lulls like, which is a bastardization of laugh out loud and sec for security. Right. Um, there were roughly six, maybe a little bit more people involved and they, okay, I'm gonna tell two stories. Okay, sure. Okay. That's what we're here for. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so one is very brief, which is they, they hacked almost something every day for 50 days. Oh, wow. Yeah. It was like they were they were like rock stars on tour, you know? <laughs> it's like Metallica. Yeah, um, yeah. Let's see, let's see let's see who we can hack today. Exactly. Yeah. And and a lot of the targets were not um politically worthwhile. They were just like laughing at their security. Come on, you know, like what are you doing? They were taunting them, yeah. Exactly. And they weren't causing damage. I mean, yes, yes, these companies had to expend resources fixing things, but they were clearly not doing it in the first place. Right. Right. Um, so that's when they became very, very famous. Um, and again, there were some very, very kind of politically worthwhile hacks as well. One, which I'm going to now tell the story of, sure. um, was pretty funny. So um, PBS Frontline released a documentary about Chelsea Manning. Mm-hmm. And Chelsea. Um, had a lot of support and has a lot of support in the hacker community. Mm-hmm. Uh, and people were not happy with the documentary. They felt like it was a bit sensationalist and didn't go into the issues. Right. So they, <laughs> they hacked PBS wow. and they did a website defacement. So they wrote a fake article and left it on the front page. And the article was basically that Tupac Shakur and Biggie Smalls, who, you know, have been. Huh killed were really alive and were found had been found in a small town in new zealand Mm -hmm. escaping celebrity right and it was really well done so like kind of people knew it was fake Mm -hmm. people like maybe they did try to kind of escape people think yeah yeah so it was was very funny and that's the thing they used a lot of humor yeah very famous for being funny right um and that's why a lot of people even people who weren't necessarily like into the politics would follow them they right. were like a performance um, yeah. brigade sure yeah and then the other thing is it was, it was funny because i was trying to like even with doing my own homework i always do homework with 
the guests that come onto my show, I do a little bit background. So I have some good questions to ask for my guests. So I do a little re reading and information digging myself. You know, I, I try to figure out things like I was doing my own investigation thinking, all right, maybe this guy was part of Scientology and he left Scientology and that's why he has a lot of money and power and he can do all these things because of where he came from, where he started. And I was thinking, uh, I shouldn't go there because I make a hat. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's uh, going down the conspiracy rabbit hole there. Yeah, uh, the rabbit hole. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, what's actually Funny and interesting is that certainly anonymous had secrecy, especially among the hackers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you couldn't just be like, "I want to join your secret channel," because there were federal agents and right. you had to protect yourself, and it was really hard to pierce that inner sanctum. Right. Um, but anonymous still believed in transparency and openness. Yeah. Um, and so they they kind of had these two sides to them. Mm -hmm. And anyone could join, you know, like anyone who knew how to show up to the chat channels. And many, many people did do that. Whereas like Scientology, you know, I studied Scientology too um, right. as part of this project and it's really secretive, oh, right? Sure. Yeah. And it's <laughs> like, you have to pay money to move up the ladder. If you try yeah. to lead the organization, they will like, hunt you down right right yep. um and, and so some like, people feared for their lives exactly yep. whereas right. anonymous was like again the hacker worlds had to be very secretive yeah and hacker lots of hacker worlds that um are based on breaking into systems you you have to be sure secret. and there is a they they like secrecy it's fun to be part right. of secret societies right right I'm sure you get asked this a lot. I'm not sure if you do, but if, if you don't, I'll, I'll be glad to be the first one to ask you this. But um, in your research and in your writing about Anonymous and all the hacking you know, research that you've gotten into, were you ever fearful for your own life? Have you ever gotten like, you know, worried that maybe like somebody would threaten you or? I mean, I had a lot of paranoia and anxiety during my research. Right. Uh, it actually, I was not so afraid of anonymous. They, you know, with a few exceptions, uh, tended to like me or use me. I, I was a good, um, I would often go on the news and explain who they were and try to address misconceptions. So I was kind of useful for them. Um, but there was two groups of people that I was afraid of. One of was, one group were kind of anonymous haters in, in the security hacker world mm -hmm. who were trying to expose anonymous and they would maybe try to dox, which is reveal the identities of people in anonymous. Right. And some of these people also had computer skills and I thought, Oh my gosh, I'm going to be targeted too. You know, right. maybe they'd hack into my computer and steal my research data. And Ugh. yeah. Um, yeah. The, the other group uh, were, were the feds. I mean, Oh yeah. The feds were very interested in anonymous. I mean, they, they kind of had to be anonymous sure. breaking into things. And I was very, very careful to not know things that then can be incriminating for individuals. Right. So, right. I don't want to know your real name. I don't want to know who you are. Right. <laughs> right. Um, but I, I got pretty close and I was just, yeah, afraid that the FBI would, interrogate me or um subpoena me and my data right right right. and it didn't happen i mean there was an undercover hacker like someone who got caught by the fbi mm. and then he was anonymous working for the fbi mm. and he did seek me out oh boy <laughs> yeah and eventually i found out he was an informant and this is all in the book you know <laughs> and like now it's like oh that was so exciting but yeah. at the time it was really not exciting. Yeah. 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 How, how long did it take you to kind of put out all that information for the book together? Because I can't imagine, like, you know, the investigative work that you had, yeah. to, you know, that uh, entailed into it. I mean, <laughs> I started research in 2008 when they targeted the Church of Scientology. Mm -hmm. But at the time, they were very, they were, very, they were a strange oddity. Sure. <laughs> like, they were very <laughs> marginal. And I was like, oh, that's just interesting. But they weren't big and global, right. right? 
So it was just a thing that I thought was interesting because it was like one type of secret society against the other. Mm -hmm. They're almost like opposites, you mm. know, um, like mirror images of each other. Um, and so then in 2011, when things got really, when they were prolific, I, I was chained to my computer every day. Wow. For like five hours a day following mm. Wow. For over a year. And I was on sabbatical, so I had a research leave. So I could do that. Mm -hmm. And then for a few more years, I continued to research them and divide it between research and teaching. And I just amassed massive amounts of data. Yeah, between 2011, um, 2010, 12, 13. And I started to really kind of earnestly write in 13. But it was super overwhelming. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure it was. Yeah, yeah, I was like, oh, it's so hard to write about this world. And, and, <laughs> and, Unfortunately, what helped was that people got arrested. Yeah. And I was able to to meet these people and verify lots of things. You know what I mean? Right, the, right. The course of the book definitely changed as Lulsec, they were arrested. I, I, I would go to the trials of these young hackers in, in yeah. Ireland, visit them in England, visit them in prison in the United States. Wow. Yeah. And that's yeah. all in the book as well. Sure, sure. Yeah. So it was kind of like uh, a, a lot, a lot of time in the making. <laughs> many, many years, yeah. yeah. And I do feel like often, if you know, um, if you're really, really doing kind of original research, mm -hmm. um, it often t takes years to do yeah. the research. And and then actually, I mean, the writing, weirdly enough, was was quicker than I anticipated. Mm -hmm. um, but that was only because I had done so much research right. and had worked with my data uh, right. very intensely as well. Yeah. yeah, I can't imagine. I, I always wanted to write a book. I've never written a book before. I always dreamt of doing one someday. Maybe but you will. Yeah, maybe, uh, yeah. maybe I will, maybe I not. I mean, yeah. you know, don't feel bad I, if you don't. It's yeah. overrated. <laughs> yeah, I just, I like. I, I've attempted it before. I like get so far and then I like have a brain freeze and then I'm like, I don't know uh, like where to go from there. And then it's so hard. I, I know. And then I try to go back to it, but then like, and then I forget about it. And then, you know, I, <laughs> I that's see. why I really respect writers because of how many books you guys put out, you know, and, and what you guys put in there, all that hard work shows in the book, you know, it is, it is amazing. I mean, they're very different types of writers. Um, certainly, I think most of them need a lot of time. Um, and I certainly do. And yeah. there's, there's weird, I mean, since this is a, a show about strange oddities, like <laughs> the only times I have felt like almost possessed wow. yeah. was, was very brief periods of writing. Right. So when I was finishing my dissertation mm. for one month, it was like, it just flowed. It was like, I don't, it wasn't even me. Right. You know? And then also with the, with the anonymous book, there's about six weeks of that. Otherwise yeah. it's pure torture sure. for me. It's really, really hard, but those yeah. moments of possession. Ugh, yeah. So, like it's the a, best. so it's almost like there's two of you. Cause like, you know, yeah. you're, you're a professor, but then you're also a writer, but what you write about is like completely different from what you teach. <laughs> well, I do teach on some of this stuff, but I also teach on many other things not related to this. Right. right? And they they do, I mean, in some ways teaching helps your writing in other ways does not help your writing. Because sure. just just you're like you're thinking about oh I'm gonna like probably with your podcast right like probably you spend the week thinking about the guests and what you're gonna do mm -hmm. right? right and when I give lectures that's what I do yeah and I find with writing you need to be immersed in it and only thinking about that sure. You know, and, yeah, there's a lot of, you know, I tell this to people all the time. They, they think, oh, just because you have a video camera and a microphone, you can do a podcast that is simple, it's easy, but yet there's a lot of like technical things to it. There's yeah, a right? lot of, there's a lot of other things that people don't think about. I do a lot of research into the guests before I get them on the show so I can think of the good questions to ask. And, you know, you also have to build a good rapport with them when you contact people. And, you know, you can't just, like, go right into it thinking, like, all right, yeah, they're going to, you know, the interview is just going to go so good. And, you know, like, there's just, like, so many things that go into a podcast. And, you know, it, it it's, again, it's like writing 
all that hard, you know, you, you have to put into it in order to produce something good. Exactly. Exactly. You know? But, um, yeah, but I'm, I'm glad to have you on the show. Um, I just want to give a quick shout out like I always do, because we do have a chat room going both on Facebook and on YouTube. Guys, if there's any questions for uh, Ms. Gabriella Coleman, if you have anything regarding anonymous or about hacking, um, we're talking about a little bit of both worlds, you know, not just anonymous, but, you know, hack hacking has been, you know, going on for years, you know, all different types of hackers out there, okay. Cy cyber hacking, there's, you know, um identity theft there's i mean like a whole slew of types of hacking <laughs> yeah maybe i mean um one of the earliest forms of hacking was called phone freaking mm. and before people hacked phones they they hacked the phone system and mm. some of the most famous phone freaks um are steve wozniak from right. apple and uh, Steve Jobs, who's no longer uh, with us, uh, but but they also had to be very secret. The phone freaks. Sure. Yeah, they have their phones tapped or wired or exactly exactly. <laughs> right? Depending on what you talk about, there is a question in the chat. If you don't mind answering, sure. Uh, what would it take, if possibility at all, for a group like Anonymous to go after exposing any hidden truths about UFOs or things like that? I do believe they have gone after some things like that. There's been a couple of videos floating out there on YouTube that I've seen. Yeah. That he does get into um, military and, and, you know, Pentagon and UFO right. stuff. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, the hacker world um, has often been interested in UFOs, or, or parts of it at least, right? Like what's being hidden. Um, and there are certain um, hackers that have, yeah, definitely researched this. And there's the largest hacker conference is in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I know that people there would get together to talk about it. Um, I don't know of any big anonymous operation around that. There was a big operation around pedophilia networks uh, right. called Op Death Eaters. Mm -hmm. And it kind of targeted and honed in on Jeffrey Epstein um, way before it became more public, right? right? Right. And so this was a kind of big, big operation that's still ongoing, though I feel like it's it's sort of um, height is right. over, right? But I I also feel like anonymous does still um, kind of go into that where he again he he's um, breaching for getting that information and exposing that information. Um, but in other areas, he's gotten more political, I think, than anything over recent times. Like as we were talking before we got on the podcast, how just recently they, he put out like a tweet on uh, TikTok, um, you know, warning people that if anybody were to participate in TikTok, that, you know, it, it's a, you know, Chinese spy ring, you know, that, that, you know, is pretty much in charge of TikTok and, you know, warning people about TikTok. And then he's also uh, got another video out there about the coronavirus and how, you know, political things have gotten behind the scenes with all the protesting and, mm -hmm. you know, and all the political game that's going on between the far left and the far right and, and everything in between. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, there are multiple different accounts. Yeah. Right? And that's the thing that's so hard. Um, about anonymous is it it really isn't a singularity it's a multiplicity you sure. know and and that also means there are many different interesting areas they've been involved in right um with with some becoming bigger than than others i i did think of something um related to the history of hacking in ufos okay uh, just in case it might be interesting to your your listeners sure. um but gary mckinnon who is a british hacker broke into US government servers a while back and he was looking precisely for evidence that the US government had about UFOs. He also taunted the US government and then the US government wanted to nail him. They, they tried to extradite him from the UK. Hmm. And there was a 10 year battle. Wow. Yeah, and ultimately uh, he won uh, and they made a defense based on human rights and disability. Um, hmm. Arguments. He he has Asperger's, um, 
uh, more commonly, I guess, referred to as autism today. And sure. his mother is like, look, if, if he gets jailed in the United States, he's going to suffer. Mm. Um, and so it's a very, very famous case. Gary McKinnon. I he have heard of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very, yep. very interesting case. Yep. Yep. Definitely. Um, one of our other questions in the chat is <laughs> uh, Anthony Simonelli asked if all right, his bank card has been hacked. How can we protect our info for for stuff like that? <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's an important question. Um, yeah. So there's a couple things. Um, it's really, really important to check your credit. Yeah. Um, and make sure that everything is clean. And it's much easier to, to do so than ever before. There's actually services like, I'm not affiliated with them, but Credit Karma, where you could literally like log on and see everything. Yep, and definitely. they get reports from Equifax and, and, and the credit uh, agencies, which have to give free reports every year. Sure. Um, the second thing is you really should uh, be using things like um, password managers or two-factor authentication on your computer, mm -hmm. uh, routinely change them, right? Because security is, is a process and, and sort of just like, you know, having good health requires you to exercise every day. Like sure. security is not something you could just do once, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Um, you have to, you know, constantly monitor your credit, make sure that nothing has been, no uh, identity has been stolen. And then if you have good sort of security management on your devices and computers, right, there's less chance that someone will hack into your devices and computers. Because right. that, that can be a real disaster. Like with a bank card, I mean, uh, credit cards are the best because... Yeah, those numbers, yeah, exactly. they're, 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 they're vulnerable. Exactly, but you know, you really don't want someone hacking into your computer um, and then getting access to your bank information, right? Because sure. once the money is taken, like banks can't necessarily always return them, right? Yeah. So really, really important to have extremely good password management yep. and, and use passwords and use, um, you know, forms of security on your devices as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's funny because, I mean, it's not funny, but it's a serious, you know, part of the conversation but um my wife always laughs at me because i'm always getting mad at like my passwords that i have i'm like all I and i can never remember half of them i try to i always try to either make it the same or something i can always remember make it simple and right. i'm always getting like i'm like i get frustrated i get high strung and i'm like i can't remember my password yeah. and i get mad at like you know the software company or you know the thing i'm trying to log into but like in a way i really can't get mad because they're trying to be secure that's right and and there's things you can do like one thing if you like your own passwords is to get a password manager mm -hmm. And you save all your passwords there and like log into it, extract it every time you log in. Right. Um, and then make sure that password manager is under a password you remember and, and yeah. is locked. And the other thing is you can use programs that auto generate really, really complicated passwords. Right. And then um, it's almost like an extension that you use. Yeah. Right. I'm not, a, I'm not as, they're, they're really good. Uh, but I worry about those a little bit. Um, right. So having at least a place where you store all your co more complicated passwords, especially for the things that matter. Sure. Right. Anywhere where you have banking information, financial information, health information, you know, for, for, for certain things, it's sort of like, you know, there's less risk. Mm -hmm. um, but, but one should always be thinking about it and yeah, they do make it tough, but that's a good thing. Yeah, right? no, definitely. And let's face it, everybody's doing everything online. Like, that's right. You know, we were talking about that before the podcast a little bit. You know, everything's online, 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 you know, online banking, online this, online that. And most people like do everything online. And like, like in the old days, you, you used to have to go to the bank in person. You know, you have to write out a physical check on paper. You know, we didn't have debit cards. You know, we didn't have any of this stuff that we can easily access to on our laptops or computers. Right. And, you know, let's face it, 
computers and laptops with all these hackers are very vulnerable. Right. And there's th other things you can do, like change your bank card. Mm -hmm. You could you could do it more often than when they expire. And sure. Um, but I do I do think like checking in to see your credit is one of the most important things because yeah. it will tell you if any accounts are in yeah. your name. Yep. You don't want to go in there and go like, oh my god, there's a house in there right. that I didn't buy. Right. You know? Yeah. My wife and I just recently, I think like a year or two ago, um, our, one of our things got, I think our accountant or somebody that we know that handles our information, like as far as like our taxes and stuff, I think got hacked into. Mm -hmm. And then just in case as an extra measure, we joined um, Experian to give right, us, to monitor. right. To give yep. us notification. That's right just in case something were to happen right and if if you get hacked you absolutely want to um you know sign up for a service like that which actually like if if it was a company what that was responsible for the breach they should pay for it right um you could also freeze your credit too yeah freeze everything for a year or right. a period of time right um, so there, there are things that people can do, you know, sure, sure, but yeah, definitely. anonymous showed like, um, again, many of them were not hacking for profit or no. to, to cause damage, but what they, they did show was how easy it often is. Right. Yeah. yeah. And it's gotten better. It's certainly gotten better. Um, mm. but there's still a lot of, a lot of problems. Right. And well, vulnerabilities. well, not only that, like, I, again, like with all the activists that are out there and all the um, bad things going on with the rioting and, and, you know, the political stuff that's going on during this pandemic. Um, I mean, what I'm afraid of is certain organizations like Anonymous can um, form new secret organizations or influence or kind of like guide people into doing stuff like that like mm -hmm. Antifa, like antifa for example now we have antifa to worry about you know what i mean yeah i mean i i think that um you know hacking is so risky uh that there's not too much of a danger in that um right. and the you know there's really two types of hackers to worry about which are the criminal ones, yep. right? Um, and and even the criminal ones, it's they're not targeting you because you are you. Yeah. They often come from parts of the world where, you know, they're just uh, figuring out how to redistribute wealth. Right. 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 Um, and yes, it's <laughs> terrible that people get targeted, right? Yeah. But they're not there to destroy your life. Sure. Um, but you do have to kind of worry about about those. And then there's the nation state hackers, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, that's a big deal. Right. Um, and we know that uh, Russia probably hacked um, the U S government in 2016. I think we're going to see more sophisticated nation state operations over yeah. the years. And that's, that's also very interesting. That's very, that's very hard to understand and follow, you know, sure. because it's national security and intelligence. Um, and, uh, that information is not necessarily forthcoming. Sure. Sure. If anybody's joined us late, I just want to give our viewers, a listener, um, a chance to, uh, let them know we have the great, um, amazing guest tonight. We have Ms. Gabriella Coleman. Uh, she's a great researcher into the notorious anonymous. She has a couple of books. Uh, she's got one book about, you know, hacking, uh, different hackers that are out there. And she also has a book about anonymous, uh, and the secret organization. Um, and you know, we're, we're talking a lot about, there's a lot of things that involve different hackers There's cyber hacking. There's, um, scam callers. There's, you know, you know, there's all different types of hacking out there and we're just getting into different parts of that conversation. I want to just give a big shout out to our, um, people in the chat. We have, uh, we have Roy. Uh, my wife is moderating the chat group for us there. So I want to thank her for doing a great job as always. Um, we have Laura Simonelli, Anthony Simonelli is in there. Obviously, they're family members. <laughs> um, and then we have Ganyak Paranormals in there. Just want to give them a quick shout out. Um, 
if you were to give anybody advice, Gabriella, about um, what to be most careful of, obviously, other than your, your bank account um, and maybe like your social security number, um, maybe your stocks, you know, wherever you have your investments and stuff like that, um, how would you, you know, what would you tell people about, um, you know, as far as like big hackers and breaching information? Sure. Well, there's, there's, yeah, the risks that come um, from breaches where information from social security numbers to bank information gets stolen. Um, so there's that sort of problem. Another problem um, is actually a little bit more individual and, and it's not so much hacking, but I think there's a lot of security hackers um, trying to solve this problem, which is you know, people are often in relationships um, and then, you know, you, you share intimate information, uh, photos, and then that stuff gets posted by a revengeful ex-partner. Sure. <laughs> Most often guys um, yeah. Yeah. against women. It's, it's, uh, and there's stalkerware, there's software that people can buy to facilitate this. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's important for people to know that this is a possibility, right? That that your intimate information uh, that you think you're just sharing with someone who you trust one day might turn against you. Sure, you never uh, know. It's it's sad to think that uh, you can't trust people and, and these sorts of things. Uh, not and, these days. <laughs> yeah, but it's important to, to think about that and, and also know that more than ever, um, police are prosecuting these things and there's, there's good lawyers that help, but this is a whole other domain of cyber um, security yeah. around cyber stalking right. um, and harm that a lot of people are harmed by. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So that's something else for people to think about. Sure. No, absolutely. And you know, the, you mentioned earlier in the show, you got the, the pedophiling and the, and the, you know, child por pornography that gets put out there. Yeah. You know, and all that stuff. There's just, you know, there's a lot of like bad things, you know, that, um, uh, you know, I hope a lot of them get arrested for it because that's just, you know, that's just horrible. <laughs> mm -hmm. And there are, I mean, uh, you know, there's a lot of work in law enforcement that goes into that. Sure. Um, yeah. They monitor, they monitor those things pretty closely. Yeah. They do. They do. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a good reminder that the online world isn't a separate world. It mm -hmm. is the world, um, and there's different types of benefits and harms that kind yeah. of come from being online. Right, right. What What did you think of the whole um, Y2K thing when we were going to hit the millennium? Right. And everybody thought the whole world was going to crash. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it thankfully didn't. Yeah, right. I mean, right. And, and in part, it didn't because there was there was a lot of work put into um, fixing the problem. Yeah. You know, um, and it's a good reminder that. Yeah, like in that, you know, you need to maintain and fix things and these systems like that we don't see, we don't see the internet tubes, right? And the software. Um, but there's a lot of labor that goes into making this all work, right? And and a lot of things that are hard to foresee. Oh my God, that's right. You know, the the reset date is gonna cause problems. And thankfully it, it didn't, but in part because so much work was put into ensuring that wouldn't happen. Sure. Um, we have a really interesting question um, from Ganyak Paranormal. Is there one standout story of what you would consider the world's dumbest hacker, question mark, based on what they hacked or how? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> I like that. Ah. Uh... Well, they are dumb because if they get arrested for it, then, you know, that they're not too smart. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think... There are certain hackers who are like, just they're too impulsive, you know, mm -hmm. so they could be smart, but they just kind of can't help themselves. You know, there was one, there was uh, some young kids in Britain who um, went after the director of the CIA. Oh, nice. <laughs> and they were able to get his passwords through social oh, engineering. Um, and they got his emails and they, they boasted about it on CNN. It's a hilarious interview. I really recommend it. 
Um, I mean, you're 15, you know, right. you're mucking around. It's, it's, and they, they admitted, look, this isn't too hard and we're not that smart, but they got a kick out of it. <laughs> um, and so on the one hand, you're like, oh my God, that's so brilliant and stupid at the same time. Right. You know? like, <laughs> and like going after people. like the personal email of the CIA, like, oh yeah. my God, like that. Yeah, like, hello, CIA, Central yeah. Intelligence Agency. Exactly. <laughs> but it's also like unbelievable that it doesn't take too much to get their email, you know? So it's sort of like, oh, they should be hacked if, if it's so easy. On the other hand, oh my God, you're going you're gonna to get in big trouble. Right. And they yeah. kind of did. They kind of they got caught. Um, so there's a lot of examples like that in the kind of history of hacking. I mean, one of the most interesting things in a lot of some of this history is on the Hacker Video Museum website, Hack Curio. Mm -hmm. But um, one of the first... It might be the first one, in, um, Internet Worm, the Morris Worm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Was, was released by a graduate student um, in the 1980s. And he was just kind of trying to prove that it could be done. Sure. You know? Yeah. Um, and it did cause a mess. Mm -hmm. um, and he did get in trouble. And, and his father was the science director of the NSA. <laughs> <laughs> you know, nice. And it's like he probably shouldn't have released it in in the wild, but he did. Yeah. You know, but it proved it proved certain things. Sure. That if you if you just leave it experimentally, don't prove it. Right. But they're not necessarily the smartest thing, at least for your own criminal record. Mm -hmm. So the history of hacking is just full of those stories. The Morris Worm is is that. Right. Um, uh, it that 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 worm that i'm referring to sure sure um what in the history of hacking do you remember being the most notorious out of all the research you've done so far what do you think has been the biggest like all right we have to like really change things that really changed everything um i think that there's just different moments um that are big in hacking, mm -hmm. some of which relate to particular hacks or things like the Morris Worm, where everyone was like, oh my God, hmm. like the Morris Worm changed everything at the sure. time. Sure. Um, I'll give another example that's not like a big bang example, but nevertheless was very profound. Okay. Um, so there's this movie War Games that yeah. was released in 1984. I love right? that. Yep. Everyone loves that movie. Um, so many people I interviewed got a modem for Christmas <laughs> after watching that movie. That movie literally just made hackers. Wow. Right? Everyone's like, I want to do that. I want to break into things, you know? <laughs> yeah, we can just break into the school computer and it, get exactly. our brain at any time, you know? Exactly. So that was a profound cultural moment, you right. know, insofar as um, – there were fears around hackers um, that were clearly uh, in the movie. And then, the, and that movie was watched by Ronald Reagan. Wow. <laughs> and helped influence the passing of computer laws like the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. But it also made thousands and thousands and thousands of hackers, many of them good, good hackers who ended up working in security. And, yeah. But they were young kids who were like so excited. Right. Right. I want to be like David Lightman, <laughs> <laughs> you know, right? You know, and hack Whopper or yeah. whatever. Yeah, but that um, Whopper, that Whopper wasn't too smart, though. <laughs> no. Uh, so that yeah. I think is another big moment. Um, and then again, I think like the fifty-day hacking spree, right? By Lulsec was exceptional. Mm -hmm. It was like, oh my gosh, every yeah. day, every day, every day. Right. You know. Yeah, I I would think though that like with today's um, you know security that all these software companies that are doing now the, all this you know security password stuff, um, and like it's a big business now, and I would think it's a little bit harder to get into. That's why it really fascinates me that these secret organizations are still getting into them with even these software companies. Yeah, that are, yeah. That's a, I mean, that's a really good point. And it, it is certainly harder today. Like, sure. um, 
I've recently finished a, a history project where I, I interviewed a lot of non-malicious former black hats mm -hmm. who in yep. the nineties were entering systems and many of them work in security today. Mm -hmm. um, they became gray hats or white hats. Right. Um, and even a movie, I think, uh, with, um, what's his say? Um, can't remember his name. Um, it was it was called Black Hat. Oh, Black Hat, yeah. yeah, it's, a, yeah. It's, a, it's a love story, a bad love story masquerading <laughs> as a hacker movie. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so a lot of them work in security, and you know, many mentioned that it was much easier to write an exploit, for example. Right. Um, and today, to to write an exploit, uh, which is basically a piece of code that lets you take advantage of a vulnerability to enter into a system. It's much, 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 much harder to write today. Sure. So security has improved. There's firms, there's practices, but but everything's online. Right. Everything's online. So on the one hand, it's gotten better. On the other hand, there's a lot of low hanging fruit because you know what? Universities and hospitals and nonprofits um, can't necessarily afford good security, right? Right. And even a good big organization that can, mistakes are made and. And you know, banks and credit cards are really, really good. Mm -hmm. Until recently, retail wasn't that good. You know, there was a period of time where like Target and Home Depot, you know, all these places were getting hacked like crazy. Um, but now they are investing more resources, right? Right. So yeah, it's it's both better, but because everything's online, there's still a lot of opportunity. Sure. Right. There's still that open door. There's still that back door or, you know, whatever. Exactly. And sometimes it's technical and sometimes it's social. Like you, you enter because you, you trick someone into giving, um, they give you their, their password. That's sure. still very, very common. It's called social engineering. Right. Right. Um, we're getting to the bottom of the show. Um, we're, we're close to an hour so far already. I like to give our guests uh, an opportunity. If Gabriella, you have a shout out or anybody that you want to give a special mention to uh, currently at this time of the show, um, you know, this is your opportunity for that. If you have a website, which I yeah. shared a couple times already, where can they get your book, stuff like that? Well, uh, you mentioned my website. Yep. One of the great things about both my books, and I only think my second book will be of interest to a more general audience because mm -hmm. it's a more popular readable book. It's available everywhere online. Both it, it can't technically be pirated because it's under a Creative Commons license. Right. So you're allowed to share it. It's a big book. It's very long. So, you know, if you don't want to read it digitally, do do buy a copy. <laughs> um and I don't know, a shout out to just everyone who is surviving this pandemic and and making life a little bit better for everyone. It's it's a really tough time, you know? And we're actually very lucky that we can connect so much online. Yeah, like, like I say, like the being able to do the podcast with the yeah. amazing guests, like we're still practicing social distancing. That's right. <laughs> and I could still teach. I'm starting in two weeks and I'm yep. super grateful for that. Yep. Um, but yeah, it's it's important to give a shout out to everyone who is helping um, people get better to to just survive um, this time. That's sure. the shout out I'm giving. <laughs> yeah, I would like to actually take the time too to uh, you know all the frontline people, all the first responders, you know all the EMTs, the nurses, the doctors, yeah. you know all the. Uh, you know, medical emergency crew and, um, you know, the police officers who are going through such a terrible time, you know, with everything going on. And like, I just, my heart pours out to everybody that is, you know, you know, experiencing all this during the pandemic. And, um, you know, I just, my heart goes out to you and, you know, much respect to them. And, um, you know, the strange honor of these podcasts appreciate, the, you know, the first responders and everybody on the front line. We appreciate what you do out there. Yep. Well, um, yeah. Thank, uh, thank you for having me. Yeah. No, thank you for being a guest on the show. Um, if you want, we'll say our goodbyes after the, I end the show. going to play my exit video. Um, you know, I'll 
say my goodbyes after that uh, with you. Just stay on the line with me. And, uh, all right, great. Um, guys, uh, we were we had Gabriella Coleman, uh, author, uh, researcher into the Notorious Anonymous. I hope everybody really enjoyed our conversation. It was a really insightful conversation. It was like, I like my brain is like, <laughs> yeah, it was really great conversation. I really appreciate you being on the show, but, uh, guys, uh, shout out in the chat room. Thanks for tuning in tonight's show. Um, hope everybody had a great time and, uh, I hope I was able to answer most of the questions in the chat group. Once again, guys, please subscribe to the show on the strange oddities podcast, YouTube channel, um, it'll be rebroadcasted on the KGRA radio network uh, Friday nights, 2 a.m. in the morning or in the morning per se. Uh, but it'll be 11 p.m. Pacific time on the West Coast for you West Coast people. Um, but yeah, guys, uh, thanks again for tuning in tonight. Uh, we had a lot of fun. I'm going to go ahead and play our exit video here. And um, I want to wish everybody a great night. Um, guys, next week, I'm not going to be doing a live show. I'm getting a carpet installed in my living room. So my house is going to be a little disheveled next week. So um, we'll be back live the following week with another guest. All right. So and I will give everybody a heads up on who I'm going to have. That's the model of the show. You never know who's going to be on the Strange Oddities podcast. You just never know who might show up. But, um, all right, so, guys, we're going to play our video here. Have a great night. Thanks for watching Strange Oddities Podcast. Thank you for tuning in and listening to the Strange Oddities Podcast. You can listen to the rebroadcast on the KGRA Radio. Check out KGRARadio.com for the rebroadcast at 2 a.m. Eastern Time, 11 p.m. Pacific Time. You can catch the Strange Oddities Podcast podcast live every week at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Pacific Time. Please follow our YouTube channel for our live weekly show at 8 p.m. If you like the show, please give us feedback. Email us at strangeoddiespodcast at gmail.com. You can also visit our website, strangeoddiespodcast.wordpress.com. Tune in every week, 8 p.m. Eastern Time, on the YouTube channel. You can also look us up on Facebook. We have a Facebook page where all the news and information about upcoming guests and anything Strange Oddities Podcast is doing, uh, go to our Facebook page, give us a like, and give us a shout. Thanks a lot for tuning in, and again, thanks again for the KGRA for rebroadcasting the Strange Oddities Podcast.